This morning we continue our series on the ancient civilization of Greece, and um, I hope that you have been in previous um, sections and uh, sessions of our uh, symposium, and if, if not, then you have the brochure that will lead you to several more this week. I think you still have something like 10 more opportunities to learn various aspects of, of this ancient culture, and um, it might serve you well in choosing a place to study abroad or to do further study, um, but um, certainly welcome. I want to have uh, Dr. Wafik Wabi, the coordinator of this series, to uh, introduce our speakers today. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to uh, Ancient Greece Symposium. The long name of it, a futuristic look through ancient lenses. Last year we went as far back as ancient Egypt, and this year was the natural progression to go to Greece. And I thank you all for coming. I thank Dr. Olds for uh, coming also and uh, being with us today. And I wanted to find a way to start this and introduce our distinguished speakers. And I came up with a crazy idea to start with saying, I hate math. I'm sure everybody said that at one time, and uh, mommy would come and say, why, darling, why? Just, I hate math. No, it's easy, like one, two, three. And that's difficult, mommy. Also, one, two, three is there. Oh, give me a break. Now, it doesn't make sense, mommy. I hate math. No. One plus one equals? Are you a math student? One plus one, <laughs> one plus one equals, and two plus two equals. So it is logical, honey. I mean, why do you hate math? I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, until this teacher came and was so thoughtful and understanding, and he just made it as simple as math. <laughs> so I love math now. Well, it's not uh, all Greek to me anymore because I had a good teacher who was able to uh, give it to me in such a good way that I will transfer to my kids and my students as well in the future. So math is no problem. It's not all Greek to me. Peter, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you very much, Bill, for coming. And it's all yours now. Okay. I'll thank you again for coming. Uh, that's us. I am Peter Andrews the little guy, and the tall one is uh, Bill Slaw. We both are in the Mathematics and Computer Science Department. Um, and we want to talk a little bit about Euclid, uh, probably the most famous of the Greek mathematicians, but certainly not necessarily the earliest. Uh, I always say that there to my students, there are about two or three things that everybody remembers from high school mathematics. And the first one is actually appears in Euclid. Mm. It's written down in Euclid's Elements, but it's not doesn't come from him. It's from Pythagoras. So if I said, "What's the Pythagorean theorem?" What would you say? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Everybody remembers that, right? And it's written down in Euclid. So uh, let me I. Interestingly enough, if you look on page 9 of your program, this is very carefully orchestrated, uh, you'll see a picture. It says the School of Athens with Plato and Aristotle in the middle. Well, this is the School of Athens, but that's not this copy right here, which is from Pierre-Francois Cosette in the uh, you know, mid-18th century. Uh, this is actually by Raphael, and it's one of, of four large frescoes in the Vatican dis, de, uh, describing or, or illustrating uh, ancient thought, ancient traditions. It's very much like, uh, and these, these are supposedly Aristotle and uh, Plato, the giants of Greek philosophy. I don't imagine anything actually looked quite like this. And typical of Renaissance frescoes, it's sort of a conglomeration of things. There are people from that didn't live within two or three hundred years of each other, all walking around lounging together and joking. Uh, but down in the bottom corner here, 
we're actually doing some mathematics. And in fact, you can see this is, now it's actually not completely clear whether this was supposed, to, this is supposed to be obviously one of the great, uh, geom great geometers. And so there are two candidates and nobody's completely sure uh, who Raphael intended. Uh, one is Euclid and the other is Archimedes. But nonetheless, uh, you know, there they are doing geometry. And I'll pass this around. This is a, a, a very nice sort of translation and collection of the most, one of the two most famous books in the entire Western world, Euclid's Elements. And on the front cover, you'll see actually an enlargement of precisely this piece here. So, and this author, of course, states without any qualification, it's Euclid. But I'll let you pass that so you can have a look at that. Uh, and just to remind you of sort of how mind-bogglingly good uh, the Renaissance artists were, this is a fresco, which means it's painted on wet plaster. So they have to smooth on plaster, and you have to paint while it's still wet so that the paint will soak in. So you can only paint little chunks at a time because you can only paint what you can, only plaster what you can get painted. And that they could put together things as brilliant as this covering entire walls in these little plaster chunks is sort of mind-boggling. Anyway, this is sort of a little artistic rendering showing how important Euclid and geometry was to the uh, ancient world. Now, whether this is what Euclid should look like is hard to say because nobody much knows what Euclid looks like. And here are a couple of other visions of Euclid. I want to break in here oh. just for a second because I think I'm going to get a chance to talk later. <laughs> but the calipers here are going to play a central role to some of the things that we're going to see a little bit later today. So here are a couple. Uh, now, maybe Euclid really should have been bald. You see he's got a hat on there, so we can't tell uh, for sure. Uh, this is an old sort of engraving. And then we've got a couple of other images. Uh, this is from a sort of hall with uh, ancient philosophers and scientists. Uh, and Euclid is one of them. He's got lots of hair there, but maybe he was younger than in the Raphael's picture. Who really knows? Basically, nobody knows much of anything about Euclid, sad to say. Uh, so in some sense, when Bill and I were doing this, we thought we really should have just put up a blank slide here because there literally is very little known. There are two Euclids uh, mentioned in various places. And it's not even clear which one is the Euclid, so two born in Greece. What's pretty sure is that uh, he lived around 300 BCE. And it's absolutely certain that he taught in Alexandria. So Alexandria was the great uh, city founded by Alexander the Great and was sort of became the uh, center of science and learning uh, in the Greek Empire. So he certainly taught in Alexander or in Alexandria under the reign of Ptolemy the First. And he certainly taught lots of uh, mathematics. He wrote this magnificent book that's heading its way around, The Elements. Uh, it actually comes in several books instead of chapters, they're called books. It's not even clear how much of that Euclid actually did. For instance, the Pythagorean theorem, which is clearly uh, much earlier and documented as much earlier than Euclid is sitting there unattributed as right there in book two as proposition something or other I didn't write down. So how much of that is Euclid's and how much is Euclid writing down what other people had done? Uh, a, a rather unknown Greek mathematician, Eudoxus, uh, clearly did a lot of geometry that ended up in the elements. Uh, and Euclid doesn't mention it much at all. Archimedes, who came slightly later then Euclid uh, credits Eudoxus with a lot of the things he did. So it's not clear how much of the mathematics is his, but it is crystal clear that he decided how to write things down, how to lay out axioms and prove theorems from axioms to logical thinking. This implies this, implies this, plus a m tremendous number of constructions, and one of which is what we're going to focus on here later today. Uh, so he did write some other books, uh, one about optics, so there's a little physics, and that's light, uh, reflections, mirrors, prisms, um, and he actually wrote a book on music, 
elements of music, which is, has a lot of mathematical. Uh, this may be completely apocryphal. There's no way to tell whether he actually said this, but apparently the, the story is that when Ptolemy or one of the, probably Ptolemy, the king, sort of wanted to uh, know what he should do to master mathematics, and particularly geometry, and Euclid told him, there's no royal road to geometry. The moral of the story is, you have to do your homework, all right? Every night after every class. Okay. So I want you to take, uh, we'll take a look here at a couple of the uh, versions. So Euclid wrote these down, the elements down, in you know, around 300 uh, BC. And of course, there's no printing press. Things are written by hand. Uh, but he clearly wrote them out. And this is the oldest extant piece, certainly the oldest piece uh, that actually has a diagram in it. And interestingly enough, this was discovered uh, in an excavation uh, in Greece, uh, literally excavating a garbage dump uh, in an old you know, town. They're doing an archaeological dig, concentrating on the garbage pit, and they found this piece of papyrus. All right? Which includes clearly a diagram, and that's so it's written handwritten on papyrus in Greek, in Greek, and there's the diagram. Uh, now, of course, up until the printing press, that's the way things had to be reproduced. Somebody had to copy them out. Uh, paper technology got better, but they had to be copied like this. So here's another one. This is the oldest complete. Maybe I won't say. Maybe it's not completely the oldest, but it's pretty close. Uh, this is from the Bodleian Library in Oxford, and it's dated at about 888 CE or 888 AD. Uh, it's interesting, again, it's handwritten. So, you know, this is sort of written out here. This is the title page. And you'll notice this is a, this is a cautionary tome, a note to you, that it's filled with these scribblings. This is somebody else. This is not the book. So if you write in the margins and corners of your textbook, be careful what you write, because you never know, you know, a thousand years later, that somebody might pop these up. And the nice thing is there's uh, a different library, or, or there's sort of access to this, uh, this copy, where you can actually see every page. Uh, and they're actually indexed by the, uh, the proposition of book. So here you can see, again, there are scribblings in the margins, certainly a few scribblings over, up over here. But this is the book written out. All right? And this is actually uh, one of the propositions we're going to talk about, uh, book seven, proposition one. And there are the figures that laid out. It's written in Greek and some things. You know, this thing's laid out, as Bill said, with calipers we're going to see in a minute. Now, once you get printing press, this is the first typeset edition from 1482 in Venice. Uh, a couple things. First of all, you actually have nice, beautiful uh, type uh, diagrams. And another thing you can see is they don't make books like they used to. Right? Uh, so this is the, uh, I'm not sure if this is the actual title page or the beginning page of a chapter. Uh, but this is uh, written in Latin as opposed to Greek. And it's this ornate uh, typeset here. And we've got another page, I think, from there later on uh, with, again, you know, good, clean pictures. Uh, who knows how good the pictures were in Euclid's original manuscript? Mm -hmm. You saw sort of the kind of crude picture in the, uh, in the papyrus. So that's the first printed version. The printing press is, you know, about 1450-ish. I'm not exactly sure. I think Gutenberg is probably around then. Uh, so it's not long after that where we get a printed version of uh, the elements. That's how important it was. It was among the first books printed. Uh, now, here's the first English version, the first printed English, maybe the first English version at all, certainly the first printed English version. Uh, the elements of geometry of the most ancient philosopher Euclid. Uh, this claims that it's Euclid, Euclid of Megara. I mentioned there are two Euclids uh, that people around it. And actually, I think the current wisdom is that the Euclid we're talking about is not Euclid of Megara, but that's not a huge. 
But this was printed by a man named John Davy. You can see it down here uh, in 1570. So within roughly 100 years of the first version, which was in uh, Latin. And of course, most scientific work was still written in Latin in 1570. Uh, you know, Newton wrote in Latin, and he was significantly later than that. But this is an English version that people could read and study. Uh, this is a lot later, 1847, uh, you know, a few hundred years later. Uh, it's interesting because, A, it's in color, right? Not that there wasn't some color, but there's a lot of color in this. And it's an illustration of what a lot of people did uh, with Euclid. They, instead of just simply transcribing uh, exactly what he wrote down, they would write, well, this is what he said, but here's how I think you should think about it. And the interesting thing of this, we'll look at a couple of pages here. The idea was that this author, Oliver Byrne, essentially replaced all of the proofs. He wrote down the propositions and replaced everything else with his own illustrations. I'm going to do it using colors and squares and blocks. So this is his proof, <laughs> instead of writing it out the way Euclid would have. And there's some other examples of that. Uh, so you know, here's the statement of an isosceles triangle. Uh, the internal angles of the base are equal, then the sides when produced, and he gets this. Uh, so if that isosceles triangle, when you produce things, those are also equal. Uh, but this, believe it or, I'm sure you believe, is not the way Euclid did it. So this is an illustration. A, it's a beautiful book, uh, and you know, a couple hundred years old. And uh, it shows how central and how important the elements were because people kept trying to make them more popular. Just like this is sort of the version of the calculus textbook now that has text here and then a margin this big with fancy, pretty colored pictures and try to make it more accessible. As a side note, this was a commercial failure. So the, the publishing company basically went out of business. And at the time, they had 75% of the stock that they had published went unsold. So for whatever that's worth. You're probably not still on eBay. But, uh, now this, uh, we probably won't go to the. Uh, hot link here. But this to show you where things have come, this is a uh, from D David Joyce, uh, who's at Clark University. And he produced a sort of uh, live version of Euclid. So that mo almost all the diagrams are actually little Java applets that you can pull around and change to illustrate how things fit together. So it's a, an actual transcription of all 13 books uh, with all the illustrations kind of augmented by live versions. So it's just a continuing, uh, ongoing study. And it's almost certainly true that the two most published and purchased books in certainly the Western world are the Bible and Euclid, Euclid's Elements. And this book, and to show you, to you go on here, to show you how central it was to education, uh, of course, how could you give a talk in Illinois without uh, Lincoln? But Lincoln actually was convinced that learning Euclid uh, was important. Learning geometry and the arguments and the way Euclid presented things was crucial to him becoming a good lawyer. So learning how to uh, reason and how to go from uh, propositions or given facts to conclusions was important on him being able to argue both in politics and in, uh, in law. And the first six books of Euclid form the geometry, uh, the heart of the geometry. And Lincoln, he didn't memorize them. But his goal was to be able to explain any proposition in the first six books of Euclid. So in this. Uh, that's approximately 160 pages of uh, pretty dense stuff and, you know, educated by lamplight in this little Kentucky cabin. This was his goal, and he taught himself. Uh, so he really, uh, that shows you how important Euclid and studying Euclid was to education through well into the 20th century. Maybe, and I think it should be important now. Okay. Now. The first six books are geometry. That's what you've seen. You've probably seen lots of propositions, even seen them written out in geometry books. 
in 10th grade geometry one. Uh, what we're going to talk about is not Euclid's geometry, but number theory. So that starts in, in book seven. And so number theory is the study of integers, whole numbers. Uh, you have to remember here that Euclid's doing this without numbers to some extent, without numerals. Right? Nobody used one, two, three, four written out that way until much later. All right? If anything, he might have used Roman numerals, but probably not even that. All right? So everything has to be done geometrically. And in spite of that, he defined things like what's a whole number, what's a prime number, what's a composite, all those things fairly clearly. What's a perfect number, which some of you might have seen in uh, 1420. Uh, it's a number which is the sum of its divisors. Uh, and he actually proved a lot of very important results. Uh, this is in blue because this is what we're going to talk about the rest of the time, the greatest common divisor of two whole numbers. But also he displayed the unique factorization theorem, a marvelous theorem, and his proof is basically still the proof most used today, that there are an infinite number of primes. And this is a rather technical proof, but basically if uh, 2 to a power minus 1 is prime, then you can get a perfect, this was in a study of perfect numbers, you can get 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1, and that would have to be perfect. So a lot of pretty important results, not being able to write down 27 as such on a piece of paper. So let's see kind of how he did this. Uh, he did it basically geometrically. So one, whatever, there's some, something magic. This is like his definition of a point, if you've ever seen it, the sort of primal definitions. Uh, you start out with a unit. So there's some little measure somewhere. You set your calipers or you draw a little piece. That's a unit. And then a number is just what you can get by taking your calipers. So three means what's the, the sort of distance you get by setting off three ones. Five is five ones. And then this business about part and measuring is crucial to uh, what we talk about divisibility and factoring. Basically, uh, two is this length here. And this length is six. So if I can lay off two, and then another two, and then another two, and then com completely fill up the six, then we'd say that two actually somehow measures six. And in our language, we'd say two divides into six. So he's talking about what numbers are and what it means to divide numbers completely by uh, laying them off in this notion of measuring. So a prime number is one that's only divisible by itself in one, so there's nothing else that you can measure. So if this is our unit, you couldn't take two because two would go to here and it wouldn't exactly fill up five. Four obviously wouldn't fill up five. One is not enough and two is too much. So five is a prime. And relatively prime, that's going to be important to us here. Relatively prime means there's nothing that measures both of them except one. One obviously measures all numbers, but two nicely measures four. It doesn't measure nine because you've got this one left over. And take any other one, it doesn't work. Two doesn't, three doesn't, four doesn't, and you're done. And here was his definition of a perfect number. It equals the sum of its parts. Well, the things, the parts, one measures six, two measures six, three measures six. We think of that as one divides into six, two divides into six, three divides into six. And if you add them all up, you get six. So that's the way he starts laying out with just this geometric idea how we do arithmetic. OK. Now, this is book seven, proposition one. Now, book seven starts with a lot of definitions, which we're not going to use. Uh, but this is what it says. So now it's time for a little interaction. It's, we've, we've been going here for you know, 20 minutes plus. It's time to get involved. So you have around here, gonna, somebody's going to have to be manning or a couple of people. But take a look at the, and those of you there can come up. Uh, we've got two unequal numbers being set out. Well, you've got brown, you've got gold numbers, and then some other color. So what I want you to do is, from the gold ones, take out uh, 
12. So there are piles of 20. So take out 12 and stick them together. And then the other ones are in piles of 10 as well. I want you to take out 31 of them and make one great big long pile with 31 long. All right, so now we've got, if you've got them laid out here, what we've got here are two unequal numbers, and then <clears throat> this is going to be crucial, so I want to, want to play here so we understand this. We want the less to be subtracted from the greater. So line up the orange with the other color, all right, and subtract off what they match, and just pull them off. Now, which one's bigger? Now throw away the, the 10, or the 12 there, and take the bigger piece. Now you've got a, an orange and a non-orange, and I want the bigger of the ones that don't match. So here I want, so I subtracted that, I threw that away. Whoa, and there, okay? And now take the smaller and subtract it from the larger again. And remove that piece. No. Remove that piece. Okay. You'll find now. Uh, yeah. So, ooh, did you do that again? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh, this should have been twelve. There was your twelve. Oh, we lost a little bit. Now then, you'll find the odd-colored one is smaller. So you subtract. You line it up with the orange and throw away the orange piece that matches. All right, we're subtracting that. And now the orange piece is smaller again, so you line it up and throw away the piece there. Throw away the matching piece, so subtract the smaller from the larger. You should be down to 2 and 5 now. So take the smaller one, which is now the off color, and subtract it and throw that away. And you should be able to do it again. So we're just continually subtracting the smaller from the larger, all right, until a unit is left. And do we get down to where one link, one single one is left? All right. If you get there, if you get down to a unit left, then those are prime to each other. That's the proposition. I'm not going to go through the proof. But I wanted you to see the idea of continually subtracting the smaller from the larger. And I wanted to make sure you were still awake. All right. So... But that's the idea, and we're going to see this again. We're going to subtract the smaller from the larger. And when, that, when the, what's left over gets smaller, we're going to switch and subtract that. And that's this idea. And Euclid's proposition is if you do this and get down to 1, then they were relatively prime. Now, what were my two numbers? 12 and 31. Well, what divides into 12? 2, 3, 4, and 6 and 12 if you want. 31, 31 is actually prime, right? Nothing divides into 31. So there's nothing that divides into both of them. So they have no common factors, and that's how you verify you have no common factors. That's one way to verify it. But not also that idea of successive subtractions. All right? So let's look at an example here, and then I will be quiet and, and man the machine. So let's just, we're, this is doing exactly, but it would have been a little hard to stretch out 140 uh, black unifix cubes. So you start with 140 and 33. You subtract the smaller and the smaller and the smaller and the smaller. And now what's left over is 8. So 8 is now the smaller. So we switch them over. That was when you changed colors. And now we subtract 8 once, twice, three times, four times. And now we're down to one left over. So if we get down to a unit, then those things are relatively prime. So that's the idea just with subtraction. Of course, Euclid couldn't actually not have done this because he didn't write 25 and 8 like that. Right? But he certainly had the idea and knew what was going on. And if you check it out, the only things that divide into 33 are 3 and 11, 
And what divides in here, this is 2 times 70, so it's 2 times 2 times 5 times 7. Right? And none of those are 11 and 33, so no common divisors. All right, so that's the basic idea of things relatively prime and this idea of successively subtracting. And then Euclid is going to actually leverage that idea into something even more interesting. I think I'll just stay here. Oh, all right. I'll just stand over here then. Okay, so that's the idea of, of relatively prime. Now we want to sort of ramp things up just a little bit, but not much. So again, we start with two numbers, two whole numbers, in this case 1,035 and 759. And using the, the language of, of Euclid, we're looking for a, a common measure, which, which today we'd call a common divisor, but we want the greatest common measure, or in today's language, the greatest common divisor. So let's just think about this for a second. So let's uh, forget Euclid. Let's just try some things. Well, how about 3? It does, is 3 a divisor of, of both? Well, sure enough. So that's a candidate for an answer. If you wanted to take this back a little bit, you could say, well, how about 1? Could 1 be an answer? Potentially, because 1 divides anything. So 1 is certainly common. But is it the biggest? No, three is bigger. Can you find one that's bigger yet? Well, with a little bit of work, it's not hard to see that uh, 23 divides both of them. So there is a bigger candidate for the answer. Is that the biggest one, though? Well, no. So you can find one bigger. 69 divides both of them. Is that the biggest one? Well, you can't say without a little bit of effort, but it turns out that it is, and one way to see that it is, is to uh, produce the factorization, prime factorization of each of them. So 3 times 3 times 5 times 23, that product is 1,035. 759, same thing, takes a little bit of work. This would take, I said a little bit of work, but uh, I need to tell you that my background is computer science, and for computer science, these numbers aren't even worth thinking about. These are too small. So the kinds of numbers that, that we sometimes think about, they've got thousands of digits. Now, if you take a number that's got a thousand digits, you can try this sometime when you're bored, and try to factor that number, you're going to have a hard time doing that, unless that number is a very special, you chose it very specially. But just if you take a random thousand uh, digit number, uh, you're going to have a hard time factoring that. And when I say you, it's not just you because computers would have a hard time doing the same thing. It would take them a long, I mean, a computer could do it, but it would take a long time. So the idea here is, is goes a little bit beyond the mathematics because we don't want necessarily just the answer, but we want to be able to get it quickly without too much work, whatever too much might mean. So uh, as we like to say in, in math, it turns out that uh, this is a horrible idea to get the answer if you're interested in, in, in efficiency, just, just factoring. So again, let's ignore Euclid and just try this ourselves. If we might think that we're a little smarter than Euclid, here's, here's a way. It's a horrible way, it turns out. You will get the answer, but uh, uh, not any time too soon. Again, if, imagine that these two numbers are 1,000 digits each. So. Here's, here's my silly way of doing this. So you take the smaller of the two, and you think to yourself, well, maybe this is the answer. It certainly couldn't be any bigger than that number. Let's take two small numbers. So if I said 18 and 39, the answer can't be any bigger than 18, the smaller of the two, because if I tried to get anything bigger than 18, it wouldn't divide 18 itself. So that's the biggest it could be. And then I just sort of work my way down, and I'm looking for the first one that I find that evenly divides both. That will certainly work in every sense of the word. It's correct, but uh, it, it's almost an exaggeration to say that this is very labor-intensive. That's, that's it's an oversimplification. So why should we ignore Euclid? He's a smart guy, so let's go back and see what, what, what he had to say. Now, this is exactly, on this slide, this is exactly what, what Peter was telling us. It's just expressed in, in the modern language. 
So GCD, greatest common divisor, uh, GCD of x and y, so there's two, a pair of two numbers. And if x is the bigger of the two, then what you do is you just subtract. And you're left with uh, a slightly simpler problem, simpler in the sense that uh, at least one of the numbers got smaller, which is what you did just a few minutes ago. Now the word that strikes fear into every mathematics student, a proof. And uh, for reasons of time, I'm actually, and you can thank me later, <laughs> I'm actually not going to go through this proof, but I will just say that it's actually among all proofs, it's among the simpler proofs. Uh, and and uh, if I just gave you this, this little hint and perhaps a little bit more, I think you could probably come up with this on your own. So uh, why are these two numbers equal? The, the basic idea is you want to show that you've got two numbers that are equal. Well, each is less than or equal to the other. And if, if you can show that both ways, then they have the only way that both of those facts could exist is if your two numbers are the same. OK, so as we sometimes see in mathematics books, left to the reader, left to the reader. That's for you to do. Now, it's actually here, but like I said, uh, I'm going to skip it. You can thank me now or thank me later. So let's just quickly skip that. And here's this, the same modern statement of, of Euclid's idea. Two numbers, x and y, take the smaller, subtract it from the larger, throw away the larger. And what you're left with is, it turns out, uh, this, the answer to that simpler problem is the same as the answer to your original problem. That's a, an idea that pervades a lot of mathematics. You take one problem and you turn it into something that's simpler in some sense, and you work then on the simpler problem. The great thing about this is it just keep iterating that idea, keep turning it into a simpler and simpler problem. So if you believe that, and, and we haven't really given you a reason to believe it, but Euclid proved it, uh, and I skipped it. Uh, but it's the, probably the world's simplest algorithm method to carry out. So if, if you know how to subtract, and you know how to compare two numbers, anybody can do this, including a computer. Computers are good at comparing two numbers, and they're certainly good at subtracting. And everyone in this room could, could easily do this, uh, even for 1,000-digit numbers. Well, you'd get tired of doing it, but you could do it in principle. Uh, so here, it's the same sort of thing we did before. Subtract. Now, the x column, I'm always making sure that I put the bigger number. So if, if the subtraction turns out to, to disrupt that order, then I'll just flip them around. Subtract, subtract. Now, again, I've disrupted the order, so let's, let's put it back so that I've got the biggest one in the x column. Subtract. Again, the order is disrupted. Swap. Subtract, subtract. Now you could stop here, according to Euclid, and, and he would recognize that 69 measures 69, and there's your answer. 69 must be a common, the greatest common measure or the greatest common divisor of that original pair. If you didn't recognize that, you could always subtract. When you get to zero, uh, there's, uh, you better stop. So that's it. Now, that of course, takes advantage of what we know about numbers and arithmetic, which, as, as uh, Dr. Andrews said, wasn't available to Euclid. So here's uh, essentially the same thing that you did with the, the manipulatives, uh, at pretty much as, as Euclid would, would do it. So here, just a small example, 30 and 21. So I've measured out on the left uh, 30 units, on to the right of that, 21 units. and what do we do? We have to subtract, but how do you subtract? So you get your calipers from that uh, painting that we saw, and you mark it off. So there's one. You try to mark it off a second time. What happens? It doesn't fit. So you've got a piece left over. Now, what happens? You take the, the leftover piece, and you move it off. And so this leftover piece is exactly this leftover piece, and then you just slide this over. So that's one application of what we today would call Euclid's rule. And so now I've got two pairs of numbers, this pair and this pair. And Euclid would say, 
the answer to the question that we have in mind is exactly the same. It doesn't matter which one you pick, this one or this one. Well, why wouldn't you pick the, the one on the right? It's simpler. And if you wanted to put numbers to these lengths, of course, that's not hard to do. What have we got here? We've got on the right, we've got the 21 that we started with. And then this is the leftover piece, 30 minus 21, 9. And do it again. So you measure, you measure, and there's a leftover piece. And you take the leftover piece and you lop it off and move it over there with, with the other uh, length. And now we've got three pairs, and according to Euclid, all three of them have the same answer, the same greatest common divisor. So you get to pick. Which one would you like to work on? Well, of course, we want to take the simplest one. Simple means smaller. So you measure once, twice, three times, and it fits exactly. And when it fits exactly, you're done. So the small one measures the, the big one, in this case, uh, three times. And this isn't a proof of anything, but just for fun, uh, let's put the original two numbers up there, and let's at least make sure that, so this is the answer, that better measure each of them. This doesn't prove that it's the biggest measure, but at least it better measure. And sure enough, you mark it out, and you can see that it, uh, it does. OK, now you can take that, whoops, sorry, you can take that idea and this idea of measuring, measuring off so many times, why keep subtracting? Why not just do it in one operation and be done with it? So uh, repeated subtraction, as I think everyone here knows, is just, I call it fourth grade division. I don't know if that's really accurate. It could be third grade. Where do we learn this? Quotient and remainder is basically what we're talking about. So here's the same idea expressed in modern notation. Uh, that essentially comes from Euclid. So if you have an original pair of numbers, x, y, and you want the greatest common measure, greatest common divisor, what you can do is you can make a simpler problem by doing not, not subtraction anymore. That's too much work. Let's just do one division. So this is the modern notation that perhaps some of you have seen before. x mod y, what that means is you divide x by y, and you take the remainder, just like we did in well, I'm going to say fourth grade, but it might be third grade, depending on where you went to school. Uh, and of course, it doesn't matter which way you, you arrange them here, whether it's this way or the other way around. It's exactly the same. And let's see an example of this. So you could do this the old way that I showed you, subtract, subtract, and so forth. But let's use our newfound knowledge. So we do a division, 1,035 divided by 759. So again, you can think of this geometrically. Take this line segment of 1,035, measure off 759. How many do you get? Goes in once, we would say in fourth grade, right? Goes once with a remainder of 276. Now what happens? Look at, look at this. So it says, take the second one, slide it over into the first position. So the 759 should come to the x column, what goes here, according to Euclid? The remainder. The remainder is 276. So we now, you can predict, as well as I can show you, the 759 is going to come down. 276 will appear in the, in the y column. Do it again. Now you've got two, two lengths, 759, 276. Take your calipers, mark off 276 as many times as you can. But any fourth grader would tell you with a little prodding that that goes in twice with a remainder of 207. What happens next? 276 slides down, the remainder fills in the gap. 276, 207. Do it again. Divide. This division is pretty simple. Uh, so the 207 slides down, the remainder comes in into place. Do it again. Well, this in this time, 69 measures to 207 exactly, three times, in fact. And so it, you could either stop there and you realize that it, it measures it, or you could just go ahead and do it. And as soon as you get to a remainder of zero, there's your answer. This is the algorithm that, that basically Euclid uh, gave us in, in 
what's called proposition two. So book seven, proposition one, talks about two numbers that are relatively prime and how to, how to determine that. Proposition two gives us this. And in case you're not sufficiently impressed, well, let me say it for you, this fantastic method. And it's fantastic for a number of reasons. Well, first of all, you have to be kind of interested in, in finding the greatest common divisor. But it's, uh, assuming that that's the case, this is fantastic because if you know how to divide, it turns out that this not only gives you the correct answer, but it gives you the answer in a, I'm going to say, a relatively small amount of work, relatively uh, few uh, number of divisions. Uh, Donald Knuth, who uh, is, is sort of the modern-day founder of the study of algorithms, uh, uh, basically has told us that this really is the, among the world's oldest uh, algorithms that we know about. Um, if you wanted to, and it's not hard, and I won't go through the details, but if you wanted to, it wouldn't be hard to write a computer program to, to basically automate what I just showed you. And it, this is an exact transcription of, of one version of, of a computer program that would do that. And if you look, even if you know nothing about computer programming, you can look at this, and you can look at the modern day transcription of Euclid, and you can just see how similar uh, things are. Look at this, return GCD Y, well this looks kind of bizarre, X percent Y, but in computer, uh, the computer language Java, that simply means fourth grade division, give me the remainder. Fast forward to the 1800s, and there was a French, uh, I think he was a mechanical engineer, and he basically said, now wait a second, uh, if, if I, I know about this, this method for finding this uh, greatest common divisor, but he stated in a much more precise way than I did just a minute ago just how good this is. And it basically, what's important here is this part right here. It takes, uh, at most, 5K steps, and what's K? K is the number of digits involved. And if you think back to the, the, the problem that I was telling you about, K is what? Well, for all of the, the simple examples, K is, what did we do? Four, we had a four digit number, I think, three digit number. But the kinds of numbers that uh, people that study algorithms would be interested in is uh, today, a thousand, two thousand, maybe a million. So. Think of it, just think of how good this really is, what this is telling us. If we had two numbers that are roughly on the scale of a million each, million in the millions, so k is what? Six? So in roughly a handful of steps, five times six, you can get the answer. And if you think back to that, what I call brute force method, just think how hard that would be, relatively speaking. If I took two numbers in their millions and I said, well, let's start at the start at the top and work my way down, I'm going to be here all day. And that, that same idea applies to computers. If you can get a, a computer, if you can provide a computer with an algorithm that, that has a relatively small number of steps, that means you can get the answer quickly. OK, so that was uh, the 1800s. Now I'm going to take you fast forward through a couple more centuries. Uh, I'm going to skip, basically skip over a lot of details here. You can thank me later. This isn't hard, what, I, what I'm skipping over, but uh, it's more than what we want to do today. So this is not Euclid. This is, again, a result from a French mathematician in the 1800s. So quite a few centuries have gone by. But basically, the claim is that you can take this pair, x and y, you can find the greatest common divisor, d, but not only that, you can find this other pair of numbers, which is kind of magical, that when you combine them in this way, it adds up to the uh, greatest common divisor. And as we like to say in mathematics sometimes, it turns out that to find those somewhat magical numbers is not that far removed from doing what Euclid said. So you basically take that same kind of table, you expand it a little bit, and you get this, this 
uh, this nice result. I say it's nice because it turns out to have a very practical application. And fast forward another couple of centuries, and you find that people are quite interested in the internet these days, and people like to communicate on the internet, but not everything uh, is, is intended to be public. So, for example, if I make a purchase on the internet and I type in my credit card number, I kind of like to believe that, that that credit card number isn't being seen by the entire world. Well, in the, in the late 1970s, now it took three computer scientists to come up with this idea, but, but they got this, uh, what I think most people would say is this clever idea, and it all goes back to Euclid. And it's the question of, if I send some information over the internet, and, I don't, and maybe someone is in some sense listening, they can see what I'm sending, I want to send it in a way that even if someone else saw it, it would just look like gibberish. So that's the idea of what, what today we call encryption. So I, it's like sending a secret message back when you were in the third grade, right? You had your, your Cracker Jacks decoder ring, right? And your friend had the same decoder ring, and you would send this secret message. It's the same kind of thing, except that if you do this in the Cracker Jacks way, uh, and you send a message like your credit card number over the internet, that's not so good, right? Because everybody knows about the Cracker Jacks and the decoder ring. And with a little bit of trouble, you can, you can figure it out. So that's no good. So you need a way to send something that looks like gibberish that, that on the other end, somebody else can, can uh, decode it. So there's basically two kinds of things going on here. Encryption, taking good stuff, turning it into gibberish. And then decryption, taking the gibberish and turning it back into what it started. So. Uh, there's, I could talk for an hour more, at least, probably, probably two hours, just on this slide, but I'm not going to do that. But I do want to just mention that there's uh, a key component of how all of this works is mathematical, and it, it relies on this extended uh, Euclid algorithm. Uh, there's also this other idea, which isn't completely rela related to Euclid, other than the fact that, that, of course, he kicked off the study of, of prime numbers which for many years people thought was just an amusing mathematical recreational kind of thing, right? Who cares about prime numbers? Well, it turns out, and this is a, a prime example, it turns out that prime numbers have uh, practical uh, applications, and this is one of them. So uh, a couple of things here that go back to Euclid. Number one, prime numbers. Number two, uh, this, this, this idea of finding the greatest common divisor. So, uh, even though I didn't pick the title of the, the symposium, I think it was, it was a perfect match to uh, Euclid through the centuries, so going all the way back to roughly 300 uh, BCE, uh, to essentially today, and it all sort of hangs together in a, in a rather nice way. And so these things that we, we see in math books that you, you, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, this is this may be an interesting recreational thing, but it's not good for anything. Uh, you'd be surprised. So, hats off to Euclid. <laughs>
opportunities to learn various aspects of, of this ancient culture. And um, it might serve you well in choosing a place to study abroad or to do further study. Um, but um, certainly welcome. I want to have uh, Dr. Wafiq Wabi, the coordinator of this series, to uh, introduce our speakers today. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to uh, Ancient Greece Symposium. The long name of it, a futuristic look through ancient lenses. Last year we went as far back as ancient Egypt, and this year was the natural progression to go to Greece. And I thank you all for coming. I thank Dr. Olds for uh, coming also and uh, being with us today. And I wanted to find a way to start this and introduce our distinguished speakers. And I came up with a crazy idea to start with saying, I hate math. <laughs> I'm sure everybody said that at one time, and uh, mommy would come and say, why, darling? Like it's hard to say, because nobody much knows what Euclid looks like. And here are a couple of other visions of Euclid. I want to break in here oh. just for a second, because I think I'm going to get a chance to talk later. <laughs> but the calipers here are going to play a central role to some of the things that we're going to see a little bit later today. So here are a couple. Uh, now, maybe Euclid really should have been bald. You see he's got a hat on there, so we can't tell uh, for sure. Uh, this is an old sort of engraving. And then we've got a couple of other images. Uh, this is from a sort of hall with uh, ancient philosophers and scientists. And Euclid is one of them. He's got lots of hair there, but maybe he was younger than in the Raphael's picture. Who really knows? Basically. Nobody knows much of anything about Euclid, sad to say. Uh, so in some sense, when Bill and I were doing this, we thought we really should have just put up a blank slide here because there literally is very little known. There are two Euclids uh, mentioned in various places, and it's not even clear which one is the Euclid, so two born in Greece. What's pretty sure is that... Uh, he lived around 300 BCE. And it's absolutely certain that he taught in Alexandria. So Alexandria was the great uh, city founded by Alexander the Great and was sort of became the uh, center of science and learning uh, in the Greek Empire. So he certainly taught in, Alexander, or in Alexandria under the reign of Ptolemy I. And he certainly taught lots of remembers from high school mathematics. And the first one is actually appears in Euclid. It's written down in Euclid's Elements, but it's not doesn't come from him. It's from Pythagoras. So if I said, what's the Pythagorean theorem, what would you say? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Everybody remembers that. Right? And it's written down in Euclid. So. Uh, Let me, I, interestingly enough, if you look on page nine of your program, this is very carefully orchestrated, uh, you'll see a picture. It says the School of Athens with Plato and Aristotle in the middle. Well, this is the School of Athens, but that's not this copy right here, which is from Pierre-Francois Cosette in the uh, you know, mid-18th century. Uh, this is actually by Raphael, and it's one of, of four large frescoes in the Vatican dis, de, uh, describing or, or illustrating uh, ancient thought, ancient traditions. It's very much like, uh, and these, these are supposedly Aristotle and uh, Plato, the giants of Greek philosophy. I don't imagine anything actually looked quite like this. And typical of Renaissance frescoes, it's sort of a conglomeration of things. There are people from that didn't live within two or three hundred years of each other, all walking around lounging together and joking. Uh, but down in the bottom corner here, we're actually doing some mathematics. And in fact, you can see this is now. It's actually not completely clear whether this was supposed. To, this is supposed to be obviously one of the great uh, geom great geometers. And so there are two candidates, and nobody's completely sure uh, who Raphael intended. Uh, one is Euclid, and the other is Archimedes. 
But nonetheless, uh, you know, there they are doing geometry. And I'll pass this around. This is a, a, a very nice sort of translation and collection of the most, one of the two most famous books in the entire Western world, Euclid's Elements. And on the front cover, you'll see actually an enlargement of precisely this piece here. So, and this author, of course, states without any qualification, it's Euclid. But I'll let you pass that so you can have a look at that. Uh, and just to remind you of sort of how mind-bogglingly good uh, the Renaissance artists were, this is a fresco, which means it's painted on wet plaster. So they have to smooth on plaster, and you have to paint while it's still wet so that the paint will soak in. So you can only paint little chunks at a time because you can only paint what you can, only plaster what you can get painted. And that they could put together things as brilliant as this covering entire walls in these little plaster chunks is sort of mind-boggling. Anyway, this is sort of a little artistic rendering showing how important Euclid and geometry was to the uh, ancient world. Now, whether this is what Euclid should look like. Why? Just I hate man. No, it's easy like one, two, three. And that's difficult, mommy. Also, one, two, three is there. Oh, give me a break. Now, it doesn't make sense, mommy. I hate math. No. One plus one equals? Are you a math student? One plus one. <laughs> <laughs> one plus one equals? And two plus two equals? So it is logical, honey. I mean, why do you hate math? I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Until this teacher came and was so thoughtful and understanding. And he just made it as simple as math. <laughs> so I love math now. Well, it's not uh, all Greek to me anymore because I had a good teacher who was able to uh, give it to me in such a good way that I will transfer to my kids and my students as well in the future. So math is no problem. It's not all Greek to me. Peter, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Bill, for coming. And it's all yours now. OK. I'll thank you again for coming. Uh, that's us. I am Peter Andrews the little guy, and the tall one is uh, Bill Slaw. We both are in the Mathematics and Computer Science Department. Um, and we want to talk a little bit about Euclid, uh, probably the most famous of the Greek mathematicians, but certainly not necessarily the earliest. Uh, I always say that there to my students, there are about two or three things that everybody 